Um, how many of you came to this lecture of your own free will? <laughs> wow, loads of you did. Ooh, <clears throat> I've got my work cut out then, haven't I? Mmm, right, okay, I didn't expect that. See, I'm not used to the sound audience, not really. Um, and I thought you might be one of those amazing uh, audiences where nobody believed in free will. Obviously, I'm wrong, so this is going to be fun. Right, so I want to say something about what I mean by free will, because if you get into the philosophy, um, and they go on and on for thousands of years, really, about um, free will versus determinism, that, as far as I'm concerned, that's all around. Whether we live in a deterministic universe or not, it doesn't make any difference. What makes a difference is whether it is me making the decisions. I want to move my hand. Is that me doing it? It's all bound up with self. So my sort of working definition, if you like, is of believing in free will is, do you believe your own, <clears throat> do you believe your own conscious thoughts control your actions? How many of you think that, agree with that, hands up if you do. If you think your conscious thoughts control your actions. Okay, there's a lot of people going like this. Who definitely thinks that they, they don't? What do you mean by action? Well, moving, walking around, giving a lecture, coming to sand rather than staying at home, any actions at all. Who, all right, let's make it clear. Who thinks that ever at all your conscious thoughts control what you do? Okay, not so many as came here of their own free will. Fine. I should say that the question of free will is said to be the most discussed philosophical problem ever. And that means thousands of years. But if we go back just a few hundred years, Samuel Johnson and his famous um, diaries and so on, said, all theory is against the freedom of the will. All experience is for it. And that, I think, is as true today as it was hundreds of years ago. They didn't have neuroscience or, or psychology in those days. <laughs> Even so, theory, thinking at all scientifically, suggests there can't be any free will. And yet, all experience makes us feel that there really is. And, of course, Boswell then, his great biographer, said, Sir, we know our will is free, and there's an end to it. It's kind of familiar, this, at Sand, isn't it? This kind of... Well, we feel something, but should we credit it? We feel these kind of energies and blah, blah, and then, you know, they're all rubbish and we should throw it, chuck them out because our feelings are not the best guide, and yet they are a guide. Ah! ah, ah. Sorry. <clears throat> I like to talk about subjects that make me want to pull my hair out. The whole feeling of free will, let me, let me leave that for a moment. The whole feeling of free will in developmental terms, if we go back to our childhood, comes very, very early. From the age of three and four, young children are already discriminating between, I mentioned this yesterday, discriminating between um, things that move of their own accord, like living things, and ones that don't. And they attribute thinking and causing actions and agency to those things and not to others. And it's a very short step from agency, in other words, that mouse can run around wherever it wants to go, or this human can scream, Mommy, I want another ice cream, um, to the idea that the <clears throat> there's somebody inside who is wielding that free will. So right from very early in our childhood, as the concept of self develops, and the idea that I am a ghost in the machine, an entity who is having the experiences and having consciousness, these things come very early. And along with them comes the sense that the self is the agent. Now, this is crucial in the major uh, monotheistic religions, the whole concept of free will. Christianity is absolutely based on it. God gave you free will so you can choose between good and evil. All those concepts of life after death, the soul, the spirit, for which, of course, there is no evidence whatsoever, um, all of those, uh, the point of going to heaven or hell, which you can't test, you can't find out till you die, all these myths are built upon the notion that we have free will, that I can choose, and there's a me in here, and I'm the one who's going to be punished. 
because I'm bad. And when I'm criticizing myself, which I do frequently, um, haven't escaped that one yet, um, you know, oh, I said a horrid thing to that person, oh, I'm so bad. Uh, God is seeing that, and that's one of the little things that adds up to, um, to me going to hell. Where did you want me? Oh, you're just waving. At him. Sorry. Um, so it's, it's essential in Christianity. Um, and here you can see the, 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 the saints um, climbing the ladder. Good monks are climbing the ladder. And all the time the devil is tempting. And the whole business about good and evil and devils and so on is predicated on us having free will. And it's the same in, in Islam. You're a precious God-given soul. And your whole task in life is to surrender to Allah and do his will. And um, if you read the Quran, you will find that his will includes killing people who don't believe in him and who don't want to do his will. And so the consequences of, of this of building a religion on the basis of souls, selves, free will has some dire consequences. I just look um, up some Islamic websites where you should learn. I mean, you know, terrible, terrible things are going to happen to you if you don't believe in Allah, and um, you will, you will rot in the worst. It's just as bad a heaven as the Christ, hell as the Christian hell. Um, every soul will taste death. Then to us will you be returned. Know that every breath is a miracle, every moment a blessing. So thank Allah that he returned your soul this morning. And this is in Islam, the idea that every night when you go off and dream, Allah takes your soul and takes it off somewhere else. And only if he thinks you are worthy of it and you're good enough of your own free will do you come back in the morning and wake up again. Um, so all of these things thrive. Uh, uh, Judaism... Um, Judea. Does that come back? Um, I chose this because it takes us to another point, but Judaism is also based <clears throat> on the concept of free will, although somewhat less obsessed with life after death. But um, this rabbi says, free will is necessary for responsibility. Without free will, we would be as little responsible for what we do as animals or machines. Yes, <laughs> quite. But this is the fear. This is the reason for why people are so afraid of the idea that there is no free will. It's really scary. Like Samuel Johnson, you may look around the world and see cause and effect happening. This causes that. You can be scientific about it in any way you like. You will see cause and effect, and you'll think, well, what am I then in this, in this um, causally closed universe? And then you get frightened because you think, if I give up my free will, if I say, no, there's no such thing as free will, that all this body is doing is doing because of its genes and memes and environment and brain firing cells and all of that, comes this terrible fear that I won't be responsible. And then I'll do terrible, terrible things. And oh my God, no, and society will break down and the law will be impossible and you know, everything will go horribly wrong. And so, you know. So on, so on. So we have that in the religions as well. If you give that up, then you can no longer be trapped by those religions. But you see, it means giving up the concept of a powerful self. Um, I didn't know I'd got such a long time for my lecture because I would have gone on a bit about the self. But for any of you who were here for my Out of the Body Experiences lecture a couple of days ago, where I talked about the myth of the self or the the way the brain constructs and puts together different aspects to give us an illusion of a self, then you would be familiar um, with, with what I would, would say about this. So if you, um, if you give up the sense of self being powerful and in control, that means giving up the sense of free will. The two are so closely bound up. Well, how do you do it? If you, like Samuel Johnson, or me, or many other people, if you conclude that free will must be an illusion, what are you going to do about it? Seems to me that there are two rather different ways of going about this, and this is perfect for sand, which is kind of why I wanted to talk about this here. Um, the, 
sand is science and non-duality, which you could take to be uh, science, uh, objective inquiry and so on, and personal practice, inner work, and sand conferences bring those two together. And so I'm kind of separating them out here to suggest the two ways of going about demolishing free will. If you want to, <laughs> you, you, the half of you who said you came here of your own free will, that's fine. If you, you know, you can say I'm wrong, and and like Boswell, you just know you have free will. Fine, um, but if you want to go along with demolishing it, let's have a look at a couple of ways of doing that. Are there more people coming? Shall I wait a moment, or is that it? Hmm. I will wait until they're in here. Is that it? Okay, right, you guys who just came in late, if you were students in the university, I'd say, why are you late? Give me a good excuse. But I'm not. I'm going to say, did you come here of your own free will? Yes. You did. Are the others who came in just now? Because obviously you came at 20 past, which was very sensible of you, but Lisa asked me to start early because the first speaker wasn't here. Uh, the others who came in then, hands up if you came of your own free will. Oh, two hands from the same part. Okay, fine. Right, what I've done so far, just to catch you up, is to point out that free will has been the most argued about philosophical question for thousands of years. I gave the example of um, Samuel Johnson, who said, um, all theory is against free will, all experience is for it. And Boswell, his biographer, who said, I feel this free will, and there's an, I know this free will, and there's an end of it. And this argument has been going on and on. And I just talked a little bit about the monotheistic religions with heaven and hell and threats and promises, um, awful meme tricks that they play to get into people's brains, all depend on the concept of a self that is a persisting entity that has power, has, has consciousness, has free will. And it's only because of that that it makes sense that if you're bad, you go to hell, and if you're good, you go to heaven. But of course, if you give up the sense of that powerful self and you give up the idea of free will, then those religions can no longer trap you and play their horrible tricks um, upon your life. So if you want, like me, if you don't want to give up free will and you're happy to put both arms up to come here of your own free will, that's fine. But I think it doesn't make sense. And so if you want to give up free will, how do you do it? And as you came in, I was just saying, sand is the perfect venue for this because it's science and non-duality. So I'm going to take the two approaches to giving up free will, which are, on the one hand, a scientific, logical, evidence-based, intellectual approach. Do it with my mind. I'll give up free will with my own free will if it kills me. Or personal practice, meditation, mindfulness, whatever, uh, many other practices. So let's begin with a little science. Um, I'm sorry, I, I, I need to just get something, if I can find it. Brilliant. What happened there? You two, what, what happened? Brilliant. Okay. Um, what's your name? Tamar. Oh, of course it is. I've asked you that before. <laughs> so, Tamar said, uh, we saw something coming towards us and we caught it. That is a post hoc rationalization. This is what we do all the time. If you look at what's actually happening in the brain, um, I think that, that um, Chris talked about this yesterday to some extent. So, the visual parts of the brain are here at the back. And there are something like 40 parallel pathways going on all at once in the visual system. There's no 
picture that you're actually looking at, but that's another story. But the two main pathways are called the dorsal stream that goes up that way and the ventral stream that comes down this way. And the dorsal stream goes very fast, taking information about looming, about speed, um, about brightness, um, very fast to the motor cortex up here. So that was happening very fast, and that's why your arms, both of you, went like this. The ventral stream takes the information, uh, same information, but it's split up, takes it down to the temporal lobe where it's related with memories and perception, and that's what enables you to think there's an object, and perhaps, I usually have a furry rabbit or something, I forgot my furry rabbit, so I threw my socks at you. Um, and you probably didn't see that it was socks, but if you did, later on, that would be, you know, probably half a second or more later. Much too late for the catching process. Now, I'm just using this as a very simple example of a much wider way of thinking about what's going on in our brains and in actions, which is that there are multiple speeds at which things happen. We're responding all the time. I mean, when I went to do that, I was thinking, oh, what am I going to throw at them? Um, and, you know, a lot of attention was on that. I didn't trip over the wires. My legs were doing all this stuff very quickly. My hands were rummaging. My eyes were looking for the, some object that would work. All these things were going on at rather different speeds. But if I was asked to describe it, or I wanted to describe it to myself, I would say, I deliberately, of my own free will, went over to my bag and picked it out. We tell a story after the fact. And this runs through so much of our lives. I would say, although that's another story, that's the whole origin of the illusion of consciousness. We think there's this stuff, consciousness, that does it. Uh-uh. That's the story that we tell. These things are happening because of cause and effect in a complex brain. Well, that's just one simple example. Um, let's have another example. I'm going to say, one, two, three, go. And I want you, when I say go, to do anything you like, as long as you don't hurt anybody else. I'm going to say, one, two, three, go. And when I say go, you can do anything you like, as long as you don't hurt anybody else, okay? One, two, three, go. <laughs> Excellent. I like the kicking legs and the shouting and the clapping. Brilliant. Why did you do what you did? You decided. He decided. Any other suggestions? I decided. Well, that's a good point because I you know, you're obedient lot, and if I tell you to do something, most of you did. But I didn't tell you what to do. And I bet you some, who didn't do anything? Bullshit lot, you went, I'm not gonna do it just because she tells me to. <laughs> Fine. So these are all the kinds of things that make us feel we have free will, because what happens? I say that, your legs and arms move, you tell yourself a story, oh, I chose to do that. Now, it might be a true story that there is a self inside who has the power of thinking and deciding and did it of its own free will, or it might be a false story that a very clever brain is doing all these things and the reason you did this or this was you happened to be looking at something or other, there was an itch on your leg, any number of reasons that would make you do that rather than that. It's a different way of looking at it. And we think, I'm, I'm on the, the science side for the moment, um, do we have any evidence to help us know which is which? Is which? Um, right, this time I am going to tell you what to do, but I'm not going to tell you when to do it. So what I want you all to do, please, um, is to hold out your arm in front of you like this, and whenever you want to, just, you know, of your own free will, if you like, deliberately, spontaneously, freely, flip your hand. And I'd like you, please, to keep doing this quite a lot of times and just observe what's going on in your mind when you do it.
You don't have to copy me. <laughs> okay. Would anyone like to tell me how it feels to do that? Hmm? Do you get the sense that you're kind of hovering there and then you think, I'll do it now, and then you do it? That sort of a feeling? Something like that. There'll be lots of others. We'll, we'll come back to this. Now, the reason that I'm asking you to do this is because this action is what Ben Libet, a neuroscientist back in the 1980s, chose for his famous experiments. How many of you know about Libet's experiments? Quite a few of you. Well, I'm sorry if this bores you, but I think it's worth it. This experiment, though, published in 1985, the first version, so that's how long ago? 31 years. It's a long time ago is, I would say, the most famous experiment in consciousness studies. It goes on and on and on, people arguing about it. Why? Because it hits at this same Samuel Johnson Boswell thing <laughs> about free will. People hate this experiment, a lot of people. And I want to explain to you why. So he asked people to do this. And the question involved here, really, is, what is the driving force that determines the time at which you flip your wrist? Is it... I keep, I keep getting rid of that because it's probably too confusing. So what, in your opinion, is causing you to do this now rather than a minute later or a second earlier? What's the cause of that decision? It comes up from inside. Pardon? An, an order. So it's like something tells you to do it. Okay. Any other suggestions? Rhythm? Yeah, you get a into a rhythm. Is the rhythm internal or um, external? Comes from inside. Okay. Any other suggestions? Mystery. Pardon? Mystery. Mystery. Yes. It's a mystery. You can't tell. Okay. Good one. Yes. Variety, so you want some variety, okay. But what's, what's choosing the variety? Right, but that decision that it's getting too much now, what's causing that? Okay, you don't see it as conscious, so you think it's the brain. Can you see here, we're sort of going around the idea that either it's coming from me, something inside me, or it's coming from the brain's action, or perhaps it's coming from some external influence. The free will choice, of course, is that it's coming from me, my thought, my desire to act now, rather than from the brain. So what... Libet wanted to do was to, he was a dualist, and he wanted to prove that when we make some kind of action, we consciously of our own free will do it, and the brain action that's required to make the hand move comes later. That's what he wanted to prove. And the way he did it was to set up a uh, to put electrodes on the motor cortex of people's heads so he could measure the beginning of the readiness potential, which starts before the action. He put electrodes on their wrist so he could exactly time when they moved. And then he had to time the decision to move that he called W. Sorry, no use pointing at that. He called W. So there are three things in his experiment. One is W, the moment that you decide, I'm going to move now. Then there's the action itself, da -dum. and then there's when the brain starts the procedures required for moving the hand. Are you with that? Uh, the readiness potential is in the motor cortex up here, when any... Um, physical movement is going to take place, if you measure with an EEG, with surface electrodes on the brain, you can watch you know, the, the, the bit of the motor cortex you're interested in, you can see going along like this, and then it starts to go up like that, and that's the readiness potential, and just before the action it goes, 
back down again. So you get this ramp effect, and then it goes down. And you can see the beginning of that. Actually, you have to do it many, many, many times and add them together to see it. And he did that, but you can time it. And we know that for a simple action, the readiness potential starts about half a second before the action happens. And for complex actions, it can happen even several seconds before. But for a simple action like that, it's going to be something a bit less than a second. It's going to start building up. So, pardon? Well, I'm coming to that. Before I come to that, I want to ask you all which you think comes first. So, who, so, so we've got these two important things. We've got the start of brain activity up here, and we've got your decision, your feeling that I'm going to, I really, I'm going to act now, that, that conscious thought. The decision, the, the decision that you make. So hands up who thinks the decision comes first. Hands up who thinks the brain action starts first. Hands up who didn't put their hand up. Excellent. Uh, I haven't got time to go inquiring why. I bet there are lots of reasons. Oh, I could say hands up who thinks they both happen together. So that's only a few of the ones who didn't put their hand up. We'll have lots of interesting other ideas going on here. So this is what he did. He wired the people up. And um, sorry, I keep doing this, I know. Um, the question is the question that the man asked here. How do you measure the moment of the decision? Well, have you any ideas? How can we measure the exact moment at which you make your decision you're going to move now? Any suggestions? Just ask them. Well, that's no good because their reply, you're asking, and their reply takes far too long compared with the uh, milliseconds that we're measuring in the brain. So that's no good. Yes? You could see the activation in the frontal lobe, but that's a brain activity. And what we're trying to do, or what Libet was trying to do, was to show that our conscious will starts the process, not brain activity. So you're right, there will be activity in, in frontal cortex, but that doesn't give us the moment that you decide. Well, on, 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 if you believe in free will, it doesn't give us what we want. No. Yeah. Oh, let them say it. No, because, and these are all good suggestions, and this is why it's such an interesting experiment. No, because the time it takes for you to say now is very much like the time it takes for you to do that, and therefore you haven't got the timing. Pressing a button. Pressing a button would be exactly the same. It would take, well, obviously it's very similar. There could be a button underneath it when you do it. Yes. Varying the... The pet, yes, yes. Right, you were doing in an inner exploration of that. that. That's interesting, but this won't tell us in an objective way that we can measure exactly the moment that you had that thought. Yes. Eye movement's a very interesting one because eyes move much faster. But still, there's a lag there, and still it's, it's not telling us the moment you decided to move the eyes, if indeed you did. Probably you didn't, because eye movements are mostly under automatic control. Um, it's another good idea. These are brilliant ideas. Any more before I go on? Right. Yeah? Maybe you give the choice of doing it and not doing it, measuring someone's body, what happens. Yes, I, I like the way you're thinking, but you're setting up a different kind of experiment, and again, you're going back to the brain. So none of these things will work. And the reason, and well done for all these interesting suggestions, I believe the reason that this is so famous is because it's so difficult to think of a way of doing it. And Libet thought of a brilliant way of doing it. What he did was as follows. He had a spot revolving on a screen, just going round like this, like a clock uh, hand. And he asked people to shout out where the spot was when they decided to move. Now, this is really clever, because it doesn't matter how long it takes them to shout. Let's say this is 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, you know? It doesn't matter how long it takes them to shout 6 or 3, because what they're doing is making a judgment of simultaneity. They're judging when I decided and telling you after the fact. 
So it's brilliant. So let's try it. So what I want you to do is hold out your arm again, and whenever you feel like it, flip. But I'm going to be the clock, and I want you to shout out the, the number as, as if it's a clock when you decide to act. Ready? Okay, off you go. Brilliant, brilliant, well done. Okay, that's great. Normally I have to say, come on, shout more, but you were all shouting, that's fantastic. You have proved one thing, if you read the literature on this, and I honestly, I tell you, there are thousands, I'm not exaggerating, thousands of papers written about this experiment or referring to it, and several whole books on it. People will say, well, it's not possible for people to judge that. You've just done it, you judge it. You're doing something. The question is, we don't know really what you're doing, but you're doing something. You have this confidence that you know when you're making the decision. So now, Libet can, can uh, join the dots, find out which comes first. So, let's say we have the action at time zero, that's measured by the wrist moving, and then we have will. From that method with the spot, the moment of the decision came 200 milliseconds, that's a fifth of a second, pretty short, before the action happened. But the brain, the readiness potential, was already starting 500 milliseconds. That is half a second before the action. It's unequivocal. OK, this was 1985. It's been done again and again and again. It's now been done with fMRI and PET scanning and so on, and different actions and all of that. And the answer's unequivocal. If you have the right apparatus, you can detect in the brain the activity that is building up before the person gets the impression that they want to act. What does that mean? This is why there are these thousands of papers about it, because any number of ways of deconstructing it. On the surface, it appears to tell a very simple story. The brain is doing multiple parallel complicated things all the time, and in one little bit of motor cortex, it's building this thing up. And after it started doing that, it also causes another bit of your brain to go, I want to move now. <laughs> so the decision to act is as much a product of the brain activity as is the action itself. That's the simple story, and I'm not going into the complicated stories. Um, you can, some of you probably know about them, uh, or you can go and find out and argue and think yourself. But this is why it's so famous, this experiment, because people hate it. It seems to me every neuroscientist of any sense at all ought to go, well, yeah, of course. What else would you expect? But they don't. They go, but it can't be like that. No, it can't undermine free will. Oh, no, oh, dear, ah, oh, and all that stuff. And uh, pretending it's impossible and, and, and everything else. But I'm happy to take that simple view for the moment. Now, modern experiments have taken this a lot, lot further. Um, and um, uh, there are techniques which can make, which can find the beginning of brain activity a lot earlier. In some experiments, instead of doing this, uh, they have to choose right or left. Now, you can't do an experiment on uh, offering somebody a job and deciding whether to take it or not and then measuring your brain is too difficult. Uh, so it's a reasonable argument to say that these are very trivial actions. There are experiments on, on complicated ones, but it's very difficult. Or shall I marry this person or not? Or, you know, whatever it is. These big decisions uh, arguably are totally different, but this at least it's giving us some clue. So these ones that had to choose right and left, um, they, they can show all the different bits of the brain involved in that left-right decision and come to the... Um, one of the well-known papers came to the um, conclusion that the outcome of such decisions about left and right are in encoded in brain activity in prefrontal and, prefrontal and parietal cortex um, up to 10 seconds. And they wrote before it enters awareness. Now, I think the whole concept of something entering awareness is another illusion, and so I get cross with them and argue, and on it goes. Um, but the point is they measured that 10 seconds before. The more complex the action, probably the longer before uh, the, the brain starts up doing it. So this is just another um, reason for um, thinking that probably free will 
uh, is, is illusory. And we're beginning to see how the illusion builds up and looking at the different brain areas. Somebody mentioned uh, frontal cortex, um, which is making complicated decisions all the time. We can see that happening. There were some other lovely experiments by a guy called Dan Wegner, who has sadly died a couple of years ago. He took a kind of Ouija board thing, and he had a, a subject come in, and he had a stooge um, planted by him, but the subject thought the other one was a subject as well, and they had to kind of move this thing around with different music going on in their headphones. And what he showed with these, when the music stopped, they had to stop. And by manipulating the timing of the music, he could make that person, and, and the stooge pushing it or stopping it or whatever, he could manipulate things so that the subject person, who didn't know what was going on, would sometimes believe they had stopped it on the swan or the matchbox or whatever picture it was, when in fact the stooge had done it. And also the reverse, make them think the stooge had done it when in fact they had done it. And it was all by manipulating the timing. If the uh, instruction to move, the thought to move, comes within about a second before, and not closer than about a quarter of a second before the action happens, you are likely to think you did it yourself. If it comes too early or too late, you think somebody else has done it. So by manipulating what they were hearing, like words like, I'm going to do it now or something, you know, um, he was able to decouple the, uh, the um, opinion about whether you did it, the um, decision about agency, um, from the actual agency. Now, this doesn't prove there's no such thing as free will. What it proves is that the decision you make about whether I did it or somebody else did it is an after-the-fact decision and is not necessarily true. It might be true, but it isn't necessarily true. He concluded that um, our conscious thoughts do not cause our actions. I asked you all at the beginning, who thinks their conscious thoughts cause their actions? Some of you said yes, some of you said no. His conclusion was that unconscious brain activity starts everything off and in two different pathways. So you've got unconscious causes, I don't like them being called unconscious, but you know, underlying causes in the brain causes both the thought and the action. And in the way, I'm sure you know, how easy it is to confuse correlation with cause. We see a correlation between two things, and we think one causes the other if the timing's right. If that happens, and then that, we think there's a cause. And that is why, he thought, we are deluded into thinking our thoughts cause our action. Complicated brain processes cause both thoughts and So his, he says, our sense of being a conscious agent who does things comes at the cost of being technically wrong all the time. Some of you read Sam Harris's work. He's very, uh, yes, influential in the States at the moment. Are you going to give me a new battery or something? Um, yeah, we're getting interference, so we're going to change Yeah, it's kind of annoying. Are you managing to hear okay, everybody? Hello. Oh, that's very loud. Feedback. Is that better? That sounds okay to me. Is that all right? Can everybody hear me okay? And perhaps it won't fade out now. So back to Sam Harris, and he has, um, has similarly scathing and firm remarks to make. There's no question that our attribution of agency can be gravely in error. Nobody questioned that. Obviously, we sometimes get it wrong. But I am arguing that it always is. And this is really important. You were talking about uh, Muji earlier. I wish I'd been here. I was eating my breakfast. Um, but I gather that somebody asked him about free will, and he was very... I wasn't there, so I don't know. This man here, apparently, uh, if I got what you said right, he was kind of equivocal. Well, not most of the time, but sometimes, or there is a little bit of free will. You hear this kind of thing all the time. I mean, if there's even a little bit, we've got all the problems. In the teensy, teensy, teensy bit, we've got all the problems. Uh, 
I think either there is some, and it doesn't matter whether it's teeny or big, or there isn't any at all. And I've just given you two examples of people who say, there isn't any at all. We're always deluded if ever we think our thoughts cause our actions or we attribute agency to our self. So, what do you do? I'm still on the intellectual path and I must uh, stop quite soon, mustn't I? Oh dear, I thought I'd got extra time, so I waxed lyrical and enjoyed myself. I will try and speed up a bit here. What are you going to do if you uh, think it doesn't exist? Well, you can ignore the feeling and hope it will go away, which I think people have done for thousands of years. <laughs> Two, you can act as if you've got free will, because after all, if you don't do that, society will fall apart and the law won't work and everything terrible will happen. You'll go around killing people and blah, 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 blah. I wrote a book called Conversations on Consciousness, in which I interviewed 20 or so neuroscientists, psychologists, people researching consciousness. So only two of them said they didn't believe in free will um, completely. Several really did believe in it. Um, and, but there were a large group who, who just said, well, of course, there's not really any free will, but you have to behave as if there is free will. Well, I say no, you don't have to. You start, have to just stop believing in it. So I have, I know most of you um, are more experienced in the experiential side of this, um, but I'm more experienced in the technical intellectual stuff. So right from when I've been a teenager, I've been persuading myself in an intellectual way that I must stop believing in it. And I guess the, the main thing that I do is if I get this feeling, oh, I've got to decide, like an email comes, do you want to come to Sand Italy? Ooh, that sounds like, no, nah, I've got too much to do. Oh, and I've, I've turned down so many conferences, and I can't do this one, no. Ooh, Castle in the Hills, mm, sounds lovely. <laughs> um, um, but no, 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 I've got a book deadline in September, I've just got to stay at home and get on with my book. Sand people, I've been to Sand before, and they're such lovely people, wouldn't that be fun? And No, 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 you've got better things to do, and so on. Now, if I start feeling that this is my, uh, my own decision that I've got to make of my own free will, it's incredibly stressful and awful. Over the decades, I just go, well, there's no free will, so the decision will be made. Note, this doesn't mean saying, well, I mustn't think about all those pros and cons. Not at all. It means thinking, the pros and cons as thoughts will come up, they'll bubble up, oh, how nice, oh, no, I've got too much work to do, oh, it's a long journey, no. oh, yeah, but it'd be so interesting. Let them do their work, don't interfere, let it get on with it, the universe will decide, it'll happen, no problem, get over it. <laughs> so that is my intellectual response from all of those experiments. I mean, when I began doing this as a teenager, I didn't know about Libet's experiments, but they just helped me on my way. So I think it is quite possible for people who have no interest in meditation, mindfulness, spirituality, or whatever, to take this path in a purely intellectual way and persuade themselves and give it up. But of course, there is the other way. There is the spiritual, experiential way of doing it. And I talked about the monotheistic religions, but of course, there are other religions, um, primarily um, Advaita and Hinduism and Buddhism, which take a completely different view. Um, I, I put this here about the bundle theories because if you think about the self, very often people contrast ego theory, there really, really is a self of some kind, any kind, uh, or bundle theory, the self is an illusion made out of a bundle of thoughts and so on. And um, Derek Parfit, um, a famous philosopher, said that the Buddha was the first bundle theorist. My absolute favorite statement in the Buddhist sutras is this, um, the Buddha on action. Actions exist and also their consequences, but the person that acts does not. This will be familiar <laughs> to all of you, but it relates to what I said earlier about the relationship between self and free will. So, in giving up the self, the full self, the persisting eternal self who's going to heaven or hell or going to be reincarnated, whoops, sorry, some Buddhists believe in that, but I don't know how. Um, in giving that up, one just sees that actions, there are actions, and of course they have consequences. We live in a causally connected world. This is dependent arising and so on. Um, but there isn't anybody doing it. 
which fits perfectly with Libet's experiment. <clears throat> and there are many statements like this um, within Buddhism. When I started training in Zen 40 years ago, I was completely horrified one day when one, one of my teachers said, um, well, you know, go and meditate for another hour and then do 10 minutes kin hin and then meditate for another half an hour and then do 10 minutes of whatever and then meditate for another half hour and, you know, on and on and on for however long the retreats was and said, you know, in the end, you come to non-meditation. <laughs> Why am I doing all this if it's going to end up with non-meditation? It's just such a horrible idea. N now it just seems obvious that <laughs> it, that's where it ends up. But it's as difficult as uh, thinking about uh, the illusion of free will if you still believe in it. But it's very common there. Uh, there's such phrases as non-volitional functioning, um, the way of non-action, non-doing, and so on. And of course, when it says non-action, it doesn't mean nothing happens. It doesn't mean your legs don't walk up and down and your mouth doesn't speak. It means it's not an, a willed action. And in some interpretations, this is what's meant by karma. I mean, you can probably tell, I think the whole re reincarnation and karma stuff is total something. Um, but a, a much subtler interpretation of karma is that when actions are willed, when we have a self who decides to do things, that's bringing karma onto that self. In other words, the consequences are uh, tied up with that self. When the self is dissolved and, uh, or allowed to just arise and fall away and just be a another arising and falling away thing, and impermanent, uh, then karma is, doesn't happen anymore because there's nothing to attach to. It's a, a very strong form of non-attachment. So there are all these ideas um, within this kind of approach. And what happens? Um, I said, I, I gave you the example of the rabbi. I could have given plenty of other examples um, of, oh, terrible, everything, society will fall apart. I think some of you know the work of Dan Dennett. I mean, he's a modern example of someone who thinks that, and he's written a book, Defending Free Will. And I pinned him down one day at my kitchen table, but why? It doesn't make sense. You say the self is a, is a benign user illusion, but if the, if the self is an illusion, then it can't have free will. And he actually said, yes, but what would happen to society and the law if, we, if people believed that? What? Ah. Anyway, do we have any evidence of what happens when people give up free will? Well, it's not quite an experiment. I can't get 100 subjects and put them in a lab and say, right, you lot believe in free will and you lot give it up now and then see what happens. <laughs> but we do have plenty of people who say what happens. This is um, Guy Claxton, uh, a Buddhist practitioner. The thing that doesn't happen, but of which people are quite reasonably scared, is that I get worse. But the dreaded day mayhem doesn't happen. I don't take up wholesale rape and pillage and knocking down old ladies just for fun. <laughs> I love that idea. Yeah, there's an old lady. Um, or a hedgehog, or it doesn't matter what it is. Um, instead, this is a critical bit, instead, guilt, shame, embarrassment, self-doubt, fear of failure, and much anxiety fall away. And contrary to expectation, I become a better neighbor. So that terrible fear, which is perhaps preventing people all over the ages and, 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 and now to say, yeah, free will doesn't make, it, make sense, perhaps I'll give it up. That fear is, as he says, reasonable, but unfounded. I mean, you can understand why people are frightened, but they needn't be. And Sam Harris says something similar. Speaking from personal experience, I think that losing the sense of free will has only improved my ethics by increasing my feelings of compassion and forgiveness and diminishing my sense of entitlement to the fruits of my own good luck. And I think this is, to me, at the heart of it. If I can recognize, if this object here, this body, brain, thing that speaks, recognizes that it's damn lucky to be here at Sand, and it's only here because it was born in England and got, had wealthy enough parents to go to a good school and get to university and all those things. Those are all the reasons this person's here. And the burglar down the street living a whatever life and having all these troubles is where he or she is because of all of those things. That is an easy way to allow a little bit more compassion and a little bit more forgiveness and understanding. So it may seem counterintuitive, as these people have suggested, but actually, it's fine. I know most of you know this. I know 
uh, many, many of you have gone far, far further than me in the experiential approach to giving up free will. Um, I've talked to some of you about it here already in these, in these days. Um, but for me, coming more from the in science side, um, uh, it's a slightly different. So, would any of you like to ask questions? Uh, that man at the back has had his hand up for ages. It's like getting in the lunch queue ten minutes before lunch is starting. Uh, he's preempted it. So, shall we go with the man at the back there, please? Put your hand up, please. Uh, it sounds like you're saying we we don't have free will to act, but we have free will to choose what to believe. No. Absolutely not. I mean, this comes back to what I was saying about uh, Muji <laughs> kind of implying that, well, that was for some things. No, absolutely not. The, the sort of decisions I've talked about, like how do you... <laughs> He's not taking the blame. Um, the sort of decisions I've talked about, like saying, I can't believe in free will, I have to give it up. No. They're, they're caused by the where I was born and where I went to school and the fact that I got a good education and the fact that I was invited to Sand and that was caused by the fact that Lisa did whatever it was. No, no. Every decision, every decision of every person in the opinion of this machine here is caused by prior things happening. Suggesting for people to give up their free will because they don't have the will, the free will to be able to make that decision. I'm suggesting, and thereby potentially causing in a few people who haven't yet done it, to let go of the illusion. And that is an action. But the causes of that action will be they're there at sand and they heard this lecture and they either something in them made them go, well, that's rubbish, or yeah, that actually goes along with what I'm doing anyway. And you know, cause and effect, cause and effect. Back to that wonderful Buddha statement, actions exist and also their consequences, but the person that acts does not. You can go it either way. Go at giving up the free will first or go at giving up the self first. Doesn't matter, they come to the same place. Um, would the person with the microphone just choose people for me? <laughs> Um, about a year and a half ago, I, I was never very spiritual, and about a year and a half ago, I was in the shower, and all my sense of free will just suddenly dropped off, and I've been kind of living without it ever since. Wow! And I always thought that I was the only person who has that, but I've found here that there's more people that have that, and I said, I heard you say I came to it from an intellectual point of view. Are there actually many people who have the experience that they just, I just have the experience that everything just kind of happens, and I'm not... That's just, amazing. I've I'm never just heard kind that of before. along for the ride, but it's. I've the, are there many people? Do you meet them? Do they? No. I meet lots of people who have some experience that tips them a bit, but a sudden, total one like that in the shower, I don't think I've ever heard. I expect there are. Anyone else had this really sudden? It just went away, that feeling. No. Uh, yes, it, for you, it was pretty sudden. Right. So I imagine it can be anything from very sudden to a long, long haul, like, I, look, like I've done over decades of convincing myself. Um, that's lovely. Thank you. Oh, and would you say that it, life is better having after that? <laughs> it's awesome. Fine. Okay, yes. so um, what I don't understand about the interpretation of Libet's experiment is that for me it's not so much about free will, but more about our misunderstanding of time. Because yeah. um, we are living constantly in a time delay. Like, you know, there is always a gap between sound and vision. So our brain is recalculating that. So when you, when you say, move your hand, you're actually, you know, you are actually ha making a decision and moving it as if to not to. So just because of that time delay, I don't know why that, just because our brain is recalculating that and making us think that we made the de decision later, I don't understand why that should not be our decision. G good question. I, I think you do understand, well, the fact that you're saying that our brain is recalculating after the fact is a very modern thing to say that has come out of experiments like Libet's experiments. 
And I infer that you know something about his other experiments which show the delay in sensory input. So that um, it's a very, very interesting experiment. If you um, tweak somebody's arm, um, you can show, or you do it with electrodes rather than tweaking, you can show that only if there is half a second of continuous activity in sensory cortex will you say you, feel, you felt it. But you'll say you felt it when it happened. And what comes out of this is, as, as you said, that what's happening is uh, we kind of backdate actions. We try to make sense of time. So as you said, in the brain, uh, hearing's going in a lot faster than sight, and that's both are going in a lot faster than touch on your legs because it's further away. <laughs> and all this has to be calculated to make sense of time and to put things in order and go, I felt that at the same time as I saw the thing happening and so on. Yes, you're absolutely right about that. Why this leads you to be puzzled about his experiment, I don't know. I think, but it's a good question. I mean, it's a good point you're making that the experiment is very much about timing. And a lot of the philosophical literature on that experiment goes into these questions of timing. But I think I better not go any deeper than that. <laughs> and perhaps you'd like to talk about it later if you have more queries. Um, Yes, uh, I have a bit of a practical question about a free will and um, like my difficulty to quit smoking. So how can it be that hey, I know rationally your reward system hey, um, wants to have the nicotine? So uh, how can it be then that the one person quits smoking uh, easily or they have the impulse but they don't act on it? And that like me, that I quit smoking several times and that it's difficult, because then you would think the one person has more discipline or free will. How yeah. should I see it? Yeah, okay. I, I don't know how you should see it, but I can give some thoughts about how I would see it. I mean, first of all, there is a lot of research, lots and lots, because it's important to a lot of people, on the origins of addiction, as you said, how it affects the reward system, um, how much of the brain is involved in those behaviors, in the sight of the cigarettes, the smell of the cigarettes, the feel of the, all of these things are all contributing to um, preempting rewards and, and so on and so on. But in terms of free will, I would like to separate freedom, will, and, will, and willpower, or strength of will. So we can be free, more or less free, if we're in prison or not, or if we're addicted or not. <laughs> the addiction is a kind of lack of freedom because it um, ties up so much of the brain with that particular award rather than other rewards. But in terms of strength of the will, um, I, there's no free will, the will isn't free. But some people have very strong will and some people have rather weak will, measured as you decide at time A to do something, do you actually do it later? And this depends a great deal on childhood upbringing, and partly on genetics, but partly on upbringing. If you are brought up in a consistent home, it doesn't really matter where you live, what kind of culture, what kind, you know, but if it's consistent, and you are consistently rewarded for sensible behaviors and not rewarded for other things, you will end up with much more um, uh, strength to, to follow the decisions that the, the speaking part of the brain makes, uh, along with the other parts. Um, but somebody whose reward system has been so tied up with something very addictive like nicotine, um, th there's a fight. There's a fight going on in the brain. In a way, I think about a great deal of this as fights going on in the brain. Uh, you know, I've lived so much of my life with bits of my brain fighting other bits, and surely it's possible to learn. I think meditation is, a, is one of the ways of by endlessly practicing to just let the fighting die down. But yours is an example of a big fight. I feel these answers are very unsatisfactory, but I, we won't get many questions if I try to say too much. Uh, the microphone's gradually coming round. There are lots of people over here. And there's one there. <laughs> Hello. Um, I have a number of questions, but I'll maybe just ask one. Um, the body is a very complex organization. So it's the mind, the body, and the feeling, say. And all this neuroscience, which I feel, feel is very compelling, is very focused on just the brain. And I think that it's a very one-dimensional view that, like, for example, perhaps there's another mechanism in the body that's responsible for movement, and that what we measure in the brain is some kind of a side effect. So in other words, to look at the body more holistically. So yes. a very good example is if you, if you can sometimes hear a noise behind you, and it's, well, again, 
you can argue. But, but the point I'm making is that the body, the, the whole organisation, is a very complex system. And there's a, recently a very focused materialistic view on just the physical brain and simple electrical impulses. Um, I think what's important about what you said is not the complexity, because anyone who studies the brain will go on about complexity. What you said, I think, is important is it's not just the brain. But you're not alone in this. What happened, I suppose, starting from early this century, although there were kind of hints of it in the 1990s, is the um, what's called um, uh, embodied cognition movement or situated cognition. So cognition means from the Latin thinking and psychology went from when I was a student being all about rats and whatever to this invention of the word cognitive psychology. And as you've implied, psychology got kind of overwhelmed by everything's about thinking and the brain and cleverness and all of that, ignoring everything else. But that's really gone the other way now, um, certainly in consciousness studies, but in a lot of neuroscience. Um, to realizing the importance of the body. Because the brain is controlling the body, but it's doing that through all the peripheral nervous system. And then there's the whole enteric nervous system and the guts and all the other things living in there. All of these are interacting, and the immune system is interacting, and the whole lot. So I absolutely agree with you, but the scientists, are, <laughs> a lot of them are catching up on that. It's just terribly difficult to do. You know, it's harder to, to take in the whole complex. It's easier to start with a little bit in the brain. But I don't think that negates any of what I've talked about. It just means what I've talked about is a teensy-weensy little piece. But it was only meant to be. It was meant to be just to give an example that would get us thinking. Oh, oh. Do we, do we have to, who's the boss and do we have to stop? Is something happening immediately now? Uh, is, is Maurizio or...? There's a break until half past 11. Should we have five minutes more? Okay, we'll have five minutes more, and then you wave, would you please uh, wa wave at me in five minutes, and we'll stop then, and I'll try to give short answers, and we'll get as many questions as we can. Yes. Okay. Um, Tamar. I remembered your name this time. <laughs> hey. <laughs> um, if you have no free will, if people feel they have no free will, will they then use that as an excuse? Yes. Oh, I'm glad you brought that one up. Yes. I mean, I've given you all these nice examples of people saying the dreaded mayhem doesn't happen and I become a nicer person. Yes, people will use it as an excuse. And this is very important because if you say, well, you know, I just kicked that person or stamped on that, whatever, um, uh, because they didn't have any free will. So, you know, it's, it's kind of true, but it's actually, if it's used as an excuse, it's very harmful. So I think that's the origin of the fear. And when it comes to the law, which I think is very important, it leads me to thinking about the difference between punishment and um, between blame and actually dealing with people's actions. So when it's used as an excuse, you get the whole legal structure, the whole ridiculous business of the Twinkie, what's it, you know, the I ate too many sweets and that made me do it so I'm not responsible so I get off. Or the hot drink, you know, that you know, it wasn't my fault, it made me, you know, whatever it was, these ridiculous things. Or looking in people's brains and going, oh, that person's got this brain thing so they're not responsible. If we say that everybody isn't responsible, not ultimately, but they have to take responsibility to live in a society, then our whole legal system changes from retribution, that's the word I was looking for, from retribution, you're a, and, and like religion, um, monotheistic religion, you're a bad person, you did a bad thing, you go to hell, you go to prison. It changes to, given that everybody only does everything they do because they had to, will it do any good to put this person in prison? So if this person is capable of thinking clearly and knowing what happened and, and the consequences of their actions, and by putting them in prison or perhaps finding them or sending them on a training program or something, whatever you might do, you think they'll improve their behavior, then do it. But you don't just do it to punish them. And the same with if you think somebody needs locking up because they really are a psychopath and they really will go and kill more people, okay, you lock them up. But otherwise, you take other actions. So um, thank you for raising that question. It's, it's a big one. And yeah, let's not use it as an excuse. But it'll only make ourselves miserable if we do. Let's take those three. Oh, we, let's have that one first. We'll have those three, and then we'll have to stop. And I'll try and answer quickly. I'll be very quick. I just want to report something, and that was 98. I was in a very pressured uh, uh, relationship, and I was sitting crying on the floor, and um, there was a thought going through my mind that said, Rod, you need to surrender. Then all thought stops for 15 hours. It was absolutely blank. 
and after that, and then they came back, you know, like one uh, in an hour, another one, another hour, and that, of course, vanished all idea. Who did that? Not me. Yes, thank you. That's a, a nice account of a not me experience. <laughs> thank you. Um, do you think, uh, or I want to ask you, do you think the thought is happening within the brain? Is, it, is, is the brain the origin of the thought? Of the ah, is the brain the origin of the thought? Well, the brain is necessary for thought, I would say, but it's not sufficient. So it requires a body and it requires an environment and things happening outside. This is the brain in a vat argument. If a brain was in a vat, <laughs> kept alive with fluids, but with no contact with the outside world, People have different opinions what would happen, but I would answer your question by it wouldn't be capable of thought. Thought is about interactions, and very often interactions between people because we wouldn't have language without other people, and most of our thought, not all, uh, involves language. So it's not enough, but it is essential. I mean, if you believe thoughts can happen and consciousness can go out of the brain and souls can exist beyond life, then you would disagree, but I don't. We've got two more questions, and then we have to stop. Oh, please. Uh, um Who's, who's speaking? Me. Ah, thank hello, you. hello. Um, what we see in the in the pictures, eh? uh, say some 30 years ago, a Dutch uh, psychologist, uh, Piet Vroon, he wrote a book, uh, a, a rather popular scientific book uh, called The Tears of the Crocodile. Be Tears beautiful. of the Crocodile, I don't yeah. know it. And mm -hmm. he, uh, I don't know if it is translated in English or not, of you have known it, know it. But uh, he, he uh, because this, all this research is about that huge neocortex we have since not so long ago. But he was uh, telling about all the other brain parts with uh, lower, uh, lower uh, functions, like yeah, yeah. we have, we have in ourselves, we have the, the brain of a crocodile. Yes. You know, when you get aggressive and yes. want to kill somebody, that's yes. your crocodile brain. Yes. Uh, uh, is there, is there uh, uh, research about not the not neocortex part yes. of the brain as Good well? Question. That maybe some things come up from there to... Yes, which uh, yes there's lots. Sorry to interrupt, but I get the question. There are lots and lots and lots of books like this. Um, and they tend to exaggerate, and this one possibly does, giving too much a, a sort of nice story to the crocodile brain. But basically, the basic idea is true. Our brainstem, midbrain, up to the thalamus are shared with almost all organisms that have brains at all. Uh, the structures slightly vary, so ours is not quite like the crocodile. Smell gets in very low in the brain, and the cortex is much more dealing with sight and sound and so on, which is, and the memory laying down parts in the hippocampus are very closely related to smell, hence that effect when you smell something and it brings back memories. Um, right down there in those midbrain sections is the reticular activating system, which controls sleep, wake, and rapid eye movement sleep with dreams, and is controlling which bits of the brain are active, because very different parts, although all your brain is active during dreaming, it's different parts. The selfing system that I was talking about is shut down, the uh, primary visual cortex is shut down, and the higher visual cortex is more active. That's all controlled from down there in the reptilian brain, it's usually called. So it's really important, and there's lots and lots of research going on. The same, it's a similar question to this man here. Yes, people overdid the cortex is everything because we're thinking, seeing animals. So that's what we kind of, as scientists, go for first. And we forget the importance of all the rest. So yes, it's important and there is research. And we had one more question back there and I'm sorry. Oh, they, well, whatever. I'm sorry. That one was the... Hello. Yes. Uh, just wanted to ask a question. Um, potentially you've uh, answered it, but uh, broader question is, is everything in the universe already pre-recorded and right now is a play mode for everyone to experience, but not to make any free will decisions because all is pre-recorded? I would say no. I mean, this takes us back to the, the thing I was going to say at the beginning I just don't want to tangle with, the whole um, uh, determinism free will question. Physicists are divided about whether it's a deterministic universe or not, but it doesn't matter. If it's deterministic, everything has to happen the way it happens. If it's not deterministic, there's some random processes, uh, you know, breakdown of, of um, 
uh, atoms and so on unpredictably. That doesn't help us with free will. That doesn't matter. The predestination idea, is it pre-recorded, would have a very bizarre sense of time. It would have there's some time at which everything is recorded, truly takes some time to record it, presumably, and then it kind of plays out, and you have to invent some sense of the notion of time which would allow for this play out. To me, it doesn't make any sense at all. What makes sense to me is there's some kind of unfolding going on in which this leads to that, leads to that, and all, and it's, everything is interrelated, so you can't, <laughs> you, you can try and take little bits out, but you're always missing the bigger picture. And there's no need for it to be pre-recorded for that to be so. All that's required is that there's no magic. There's no spirits, souls, tricks, consciousness intervening, nothing like that. There's just stuff happening because it has to. And that's fine. Doesn't need any pre-recording. But you could be right. Maybe you could uh, uh, make something out of that, um, uh, that idea. Now, there's a man who's been very patient in the front. Have you got a very short one? No? I'm being told that's absolutely it. I'm very sorry. Uh... Yeah.